is an honor to give the last lecture to the class of 2022. I've actually gotten to do this for a few years running now, and it's honestly very flattering to think that you guys think that I've still got more knowledge in me. Two years ago, I talked about teaching. Last year, I talked about humility. This year, I thought I'd talk a little bit about learning. Sometimes, after the excitement of match day fades and the reality starts to set in, that in just a few months, you're going to be taking care of real patients as an intern. Sometimes it's easy to feel nervous, and um, some of you may even start to think that you're not ready. So let me tell you, you are. I actually, I hope that each of you will pause and take just a moment to reflect on just how much you've learned while you've been in medical school. In fact, you've learned and grown so much that it's actually probably hard to really envision, really feel the person that you used to be. But, but try to feel it. Try to feel the way that you felt when you first walked onto this campus on some hot August afternoon years ago. You really have learned a lot. And I'm sure that you all have fond memories of your favorite teachers at EVMS because without their wisdom and expertise, there's absolutely no way that you'd be the doctors that you are today. So let's pause for just a moment and recognize those finest teachers, first aid, sketchy micro, and of course, you world. According to my notes, this is where I wait for laughter to subside, but seeing that it's subsided, I'll move on because I actually do have a point to make here. And that point is that the curriculum from here on out changes. The way that you learn in medical school is very well established. I mean, some of you might have come to my kidney lectures, but some of you may be seeing me for the first time because you use boards and beyond. The point is that for most of medical school, you know what you need to learn, and there are high-quality, prepackaged resources available to help you learn it. But as you move into real practice, how you learn what you need to know to be a good doctor, it becomes less well-defined. For residency, fellowship, and beyond, there's no first aid. The resources that you've used to get you here, they've taken you as far as you can. And so as you move off from medical school and into this next phase of your career, you're going to need to find some new resources to help you learn so that you can become the physician that you want to be. And so that's really what I thought I'd talk with you about your last lecture, because I've got some suggestions for what those resources should be. Your first and probably your best resource to learn from in the years ahead is your patients. Believe me, there's no greater source of knowledge and insight. You want to understand the natural history of a disease? Study your patients. You want to make that elusive diagnosis? Listen to your patients. I actually have one very granular, very practical piece of advice to help you learn, and that's to follow up on your patients. Trust me, you're going to see a patient in the ED or as a consult, or maybe you'll just be reading their CT scan or biopsy, but you're going to wonder, what was that? I mean, what, what does this patient have? Well, you ought to keep a little list of those patients in your power chart or epic and, and follow them and watch how things play out. I promise that list is going to become a treasure trove of learning as you move through your career. And never forget that your patients have things to teach you beyond disease pathophysiology. If you're an engaged learner, you're going to learn secrets from your patients that are hard, maybe even impossible to learn any other way. Things as big as what really makes life meaningful or how you maintain dignity in the face of illness or tragedy. Second, you should learn from experience. Often, there's no greater teacher. It's been almost 15 years since Malcolm Gladwell published his book, Outliers, which helped to popularize this 10,000-hour rule. I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. It's, um, it's based on the observation that elite performers, whether we're talking about a concert pianist or an author or a computer programmer, these elite performers, they consistently spend more time in deliberate practice, and they have spent more time in deliberate practice than those who are not elite. It's given rise to this notion that maybe there's this grand unifying theory of genius, um, which is that what sets a genius apart from others, regardless of the field, is actually that person's opportunity and capacity for deliberate practice. So if you want to become an elite physician, one of the best things you can do in your residency is embrace the opportunity for deliberate practice. Residency is where you're going to get your 10,000 hours. And, um, and look, it's going to be doled out to you one 80-hour work week at a time. And often it's hard to keep your appetite for deliberate practice when so much practice is being force-fed to you. But try. Retake the history. 
read your own films, do the procedure, scrub into the case, pull back that curtain and go see that last patient before your shift ends. Your future self is going to thank you. That said, um, you know, experience may be the best teacher, but all of you need to understand that it can't be your only teacher. As a physician, some of the most important diagnoses that you're going to be in a position to make are things that you may see only once or twice in your career. You got to be prepared to seize those opportunities without the benefit of having done it before. Way back when I was a medical student rotating on the surgery service, I heard this story about something that had happened with one of the surgery residents. 15 years on, the clinical details are a little fuzzy, but the gist of it was this. There was a post-operative patient in respiratory distress. He'd undergone a surgical procedure for some kind of head or neck tumor, and um, it was a complicated case. He was losing his airway rapidly, probably from post-operative bleeding. So the surgery resident who had been called to the bedside immediately calls the anesthesiology team to assist in reintubating the patient. Within a few minutes, the senior anesthesiologist arrived. He was actually the same physician who had intubated this patient previously. But despite all of his expertise and all the tools, he could not secure the airway. So as the anesthesiologist is preparing for one last attempt, suddenly the senior surgery resident jumps forward and he picks up a big needle and he inserts it into the patient's airway. And then he feeds through this vascular catheter until it appears in the posterior pharynx reaches through and grabs it with some clamps, and then he threads that onto an endotracheal tube. And they advance the endotracheal tube into position, and then he turns things over to the anesthesiologist to begin ventilating the patient. And as the patient's starting to turn pink again, someone in, in awe turns to the surgery resident and says, wow, how many times have you had to do that before? And the resident says, I've, I've never done it before, but I've thought about it a lot. Now, when I was told this story, I was told it in the manner in which these war stories usually get told, with an emphasis on the gory details and the courage under pressure. With the resident's comment at the end, I think, I think it was intended to provide some punctuation or maybe a little comic relief. But to me, there was a powerful truth in what he said. I've thought about it a lot. I've thought about his words a lot. And I think that kind of mental preparation is what you need to counterbalance the wisdom that you learn through experience. The third resource, you should learn from your teachers. Because in residency, you're still going to have teachers. But there's a big difference between your teachers in M1 and M2 and the teachers that you find on the wards or in residency. Because when a teacher is standing in front of you in the classroom, it's almost like you see them in 2D. They carefully curate what they want you to learn, and you just have to learn it. But when you watch your teachers practice real medicine in the real world, that's when you see them in 3D. It allows you to see things from multiple angles, and it means that you have to deliberately curate what it is that they're teaching you. You got to keep your eyes open because you get to decide what you want to learn and, and you get to decide who you want to be. So a long time ago, I got to attend a delivery. It was one of the first few deliveries that I attended, but um, I remember so much of it so vividly that um, it's actually easy for me to, to still conjure up the sensory experience. The first sensation I remember was the warmth that I felt on my face when the pediatrics team came running into the patient's room. There was a distinct temperature gradient from the cooler hallway into the patient's room. Maybe it was more noticeable because the team had rushed over there so quickly because we'd been paged that there was a patient about to deliver a 22-week um, gestation infant. And as you all know, 22 weeks gestation, that's it's below the threshold of viability. A 23-weeker might have a chance of survival in the NICU, but a 22-weeker, not so much. So the plan, as it was elaborated to me as the most junior member of the team, as we huddled in the corner and the glow of the radiant warmer, was that the attending neonatologist would quickly examine the baby and decide if a resuscitation would even be attempted. The next sensation I remember was the eerie silence. The actual delivery of the baby was accompanied by the usual sounds of a new human being joining the world. Only this time, after the baby was born, everything instantaneously became deathly quiet. There was no cry, at least not one strong enough for you to hear. And all of a sudden, the hustle and bustle around the mother silenced as the mother and the medical staff all turned their attention to the corner of the room where the neonatologist was about to examine the baby. All eyes were on the neonatologist. 
He walked over, but then stopped just short of the radiant warmer. He bent slightly at the waist, and he peered over his glasses. Now look, this man had decades of experience, and I think he probably can take in more in a few seconds than I could have gleaned if I had been able to do a full physical exam. He touched the patient once. He reached out one gloved hand, and he looked at the baby's foot. He held it up to his thumb. The whole process took maybe 10 seconds, but he was ready to read the verdict. I'm sorry, ma'am, he said. Your baby's too small. There's nothing we can do. And with that, he removed his gloves, and he took them off in such a way that it made this loud snap right before he tossed them in the wastebasket. And then he turned on his heel and left, and the rest of the team retrailed behind him. The next sensory memory I have is the visual image as I looked over my shoulder of the mother's eyes welling up with tears and then the anguished cries that filled the otherwise still hallway on labor and delivery as the rest of the team followed the attending out the door. Like every patient encounter that you have in medical school and residency, this is a teaching moment. There was something to learn about medical management. I mean, the medical decision-making here, it, it was heartbreaking, but it was correct. But obviously there was something more to learn. And the lesson that I tried to take from this encounter was that um, there's almost never nothing that we can do. Even if it's nothing more than a little bit of your time to offer compassion and empathy on one of the darkest days of someone's life, it's still something. And maybe that's a dramatic example, but the point is that as you go through your residency, there's gonna be teaching all around you. Some of it's gonna be good and some of it's gonna be bad. But if you're paying attention, you're going to learn things. You'll hear attendings turn a phrase, or you'll see the way they throw a stitch, and you're going to say, that's a good way of doing it. I want to emulate that in my own practice. But you'll see other examples of things that don't go well, and you need to learn from those too. You get to decide who you want to be. The last thing I want you to learn from is yourself. Each of you may have used different learning resources to get to this point, but there's one thing that all of you have learned along the way. You've learned enough about yourself to know how you learn. Some of you went to class, some of you, all right, most of you didn't. Some of you lived by Anki, some of you lived inside you world. But all of you have been successful. And I think the key insight here is that you, you are the key ingredient to your success. You are the secret sauce for your own education. So don't forget that as you move into your career as a physician, because the learning, the learning doesn't stop. I'm proud of all of you. I think you're all amazing, and I wish you the very best for whatever lies ahead. Thank you for letting me speak today.